Hey guys and welcome to a new video. For sure you will remember my X299 VRM disaster video and as a follow up to this video we will test today how much it helps if you use an EK monoblock. So I'm using the MSI X299 Pro Gaming Carbon AC. That's actually a very very solid board. It only lacks cooling on the VRM. So the thing is we have an five uh, phase uh, VRM design using IR3555M which is a very very solid power stage and the power stage gets doubled to 10 phases using the IR3599 uh, which is located on uh, the back behind uh, the VRMs. So we have in total 11 power stages on there because we have 10 um, doubled phases for V-Core and then we have another additional uh, power stage for VCCSA voltage. The VR hot is triggered at 105 degrees Celsius. That means whenever the VRMs hit 105 degrees Celsius, then the VRM will throttle down or the VRM will throttle down the CPU so uh, the VRM can cool down a little bit. I'm using the i9-7900X on here. The CPU is deleted and we will of course overclock the CPU to get the maximum power consumption out of this. And then we can see what the effect is if we change to a better cooling solution. So in the first step I will use the EK Supremacy EVO which is in my opinion probably the best CPU cooler you can get on the market. So we will use that one first and test the VRMs on stock, see what the VRM temperature will be. Then we will change the thermal pads on the stock VRM cooler. I'm using some minus pad 8 from Thermal Grizzly for that. And Finally, we will change to this beautiful EK monoblock. It's actually very, very nice looking. I love how they uh, use a stainless steel plate in combination with um, nickel plated copper. And you cannot even see a difference between the nickel plated copper and the stainless steel. It looks just ab absolutely amazing. Very, very nice work. So I'm really looking forward to see what the actual difference is when it comes to VRM temperature. So it's also the first time that I do this kind of test for VRM, um, using a monoblock for the VRM. So as a water cooler itself, I will use uh, this combination, which I always use for my, my cooling testing. So I have a 240 radiator with uh, Corsair fans. It's not the biggest radiator, but it's very convenient to use this because I have the EK DDC pump reservoir combination mounted directly in front of it. And I have an acrylic stand made for it. So I can just put it right on my table. Of course, if you use a 360 radiator or maybe 420 or something even bigger, you will have better temperatures than what I can reach in this video. But it should be um, good enough cooling to just uh, see the differences between uh, stock cooling, AIO, AIO cooling, um, the EK Supremacy EVO and the water block, the monoblock. So I will be back uh, in a bit after mounting the EK Supremacy EVO and then we will take a look at the results. All right, I'm back and I'm actually done with my testing. So before we go to the test results, let's first talk about how we mount all the components, what is special about mounting the components, and all this kind of stuff. So um, the first thing I did was actually testing with the X61 Kraken. I did all that before this video. So we will just use the, those data for the results for the comparison later. So the first thing I did was, uh, for this test was to mount the EK Supremacy EVO CPU cooler. And actually, I mean, the mounting is really, really easy, probably easier than, than any air cooler. So all you have to do is mount four screws into the socket and then you um, apply some thermal paste in the middle. You peel off the foil that's underneath the CPU cooler for protection. Never forget that. Mount the CPU cooler, mount it with the screws and then you're done. The second te test I did was leaving the EK Supremacy EVO on and changing the thermal pad of the stock VRM cooler to the thermal grizzly pad. It's actually very easy. You just take uh, the thermal pad, cut it to the right size and put it back on. So that only takes like one minute. And the last test we did, of course, with the EK monoblock. So the EK monoblock is a little bit more complicated um, when it comes to the mounting than a normal CPU, CPU cooler, but it's still fairly easy. So the first thing you have to do is prepare the CPU, obviously. So again, you apply thermal paste. Usually if I apply thermal paste, I just put a drop in the middle and then I spread it uh, all over the CPU. It doesn't have to be perfectly spread because the mounting pressure of any CPU cooler is so high that it will push away anything that's in the way. Also, when, it, when I hear those like, oh, there's this, uh, you will have air bubbles between your CPU and the cooler, that's a complete myth. If you have that high mounting pressure from the CPU cooler, I can assure you there's nothing in between anymore. 
So just do that. Afterwards, you have to prepare the monoblock for the VRMs. So you have to take the thermal pad and cut it to the correct size for um, the MOSFETs and for the inductors. That's also one positive or very good aspect about using the monoblock. If you compare the stock cooler, the stock VRM cooler to the monoblock, the stock cooler only cools um, the IR3555M, uh, the, the power stages, while the monoblock cools the power stages and the inductors at the same time. So actually you have a lot more surface area to dissipate the heat, which helps quite a lot because actually the inductors get really, really hot as well if you're running load. So after preparing the monoblock with the, with the tunnel pads, you put the monoblock down onto your mainboard. One thing I noticed what, was that there is some foil, like, like black foil between the ILM and the mainboard. So I had to use a screwdriver and punch holes into the foil so I could mount the monoblock, but that's not really an issue. Um, could be that it's because of an engineering sample. I'm not really sure about that. Anyway, so you mount the monoblock um, with four screws from the back on the CPU, and then you have to put two more screws on the VRM area for the monoblock. Actually, if you do that, be really, really careful because I noticed that if you apply a little bit too much pressure on the VRM area, it's very easy to bend the PCB. And then it should be quite bad contact if it bends like this underneath the monoblock. So just gentle pressure, not too much, and then it should be perfectly fine. So let's go over to the results. So the first test I did, uh, as I said, was with the X61 Kraken and I was running the i9-7900X at 4.5 GHz um, using 1.175 V-Core. And doing that with Prime 95 uh, 26.6 non-AVX Prime, I hit a CPU temperature of 79 degrees Celsius maximum. And the VRM actually hit the temperature limit and at after nine minutes, the temperature limit was 107 degrees Celsius under load until the CPU throttled down. Obviously, because I'm using an open test bench, there is zero airflow, so it's not that easy for the VRM to get rid of the heat. I did the same testing um, like few video videos back if you want to check it inside a case. And actually the same thing happens inside a case, it's just it just happens later. So in the case, it would maybe take like 20 minutes until the VRM uh, hits, the, hits the temperature, VRM hot. So it's basically the same, it just happens earlier on an op open test bench. So the second test was with the EK Supremacy EVO and the CPU temperature is six degrees Celsius lower. So we have uh, 73 degrees Celsius and considering that both cooling systems, the X61 and the EK, my EK solution, both use a 20, 240 millimeter radiator, um, it's a pretty good, performance difference, six degrees Celsius. I totally approve that. Uh, one thing I also noticed that the VRM took longer to throttle. So instead of nine minutes, it took 13 minutes until the VRM throttles. And I think that's mainly because the CPU is running colder. So the PCB can dissipate a little bit more heat from the VRM to the CPU. And therefore um, it takes just a little bit longer and the, until the VRM throttles in this kind of condition. So in the next test, I still left the EK Supremacy EVO on, but I changed the thermal pad of the stock VRM cooler and that actually helped quite a bit. So that the, during the test initially, I saw that the VRM was like 12 degrees Celsius colder, but then eventually it still hit 107 degrees, 107 degrees Celsius, but just uh, took like five minutes longer. So for sure it helps to change the thermal pad, but um, I mean, if the VRM cooler doesn't have enough uh, surface area, it's still not gonna be perfect. So in the last test, for sure, I mounted the EK monoblock and actually the temps were really, really nice. The CPU was running 76 degrees Celsius max. So it's actually uh, three degrees warmer than the uh, EK Supremacy EVO, but that should be mainly because um, now we're also dissipate, dissipating all the heat from the VRM into the same cooling loop. So, and if you consider that it could be like 20 to 30 watt additional heat inside the cooling loop, it makes sense that the water is getting a little bit warmer and therefore the CPU is also running a bit warmer. For sure, if you run a bigger radiator, that should be completely um, evened out and probably you should have the same CPU temperatures uh, using the monoblock and the Supremacy EVO. What is really nice is actually the VRM temperature. So the VRM temperature and load maximum was 58 degrees Celsius. So that's like 50 degrees temperature difference, which is absolutely massive. So I can only really recommend if you wanna do strong overclocking on X299, 
Um, actually also an X399, it's the same thing there. Um, you should get a monoblock for this. So additional test I did was uh, trying to, to run max frequency on the CPU, which on this sample was 4.8 gigahertz running 1.28 volt. And the CPU hit 92 degrees Celsius using the EK Supremacy EVO with a 240 radiator. And the only thing is that the VRMs hit 107 degrees Celsius after already seven minutes, just because it's so much heat um, coming from the VRMs in this condition. Using the monoblock, I was really on the edge because the CPU was hitting 94 degree Celsius sometimes, because, and that's TJ Maxx for the CPU on stock. You can increase that to 105 if you want to. I didn't do it for this test, but you can do it without any issues. The cool thing is that the VRMs stayed at 70 degrees Celsius max, even at 4.8 prime 95, so that's absolutely amazing. Um, I mean, that's like a birthday party for the VRMs, um, perfectly fine. So I can absolutely recommend this. And personally, actually, um, the board itself is also very good. I have to admit that. Um, I really like the VRMs and also the BIOS is uh, very easy to use. Um, I mean, look at the, looking at the, the visuals, just having this black and silver, like it's a very, very elegant look in combination with the G-Skill Trident, uh, Trident Z memories. I was actually thinking if I should put that into my 24-7 rig because it looks very, very nice actually with the uh, EK monoblock. And also, that was also the reason why I didn't use any colored fluid because I really like the way it looks with the black and silver. I would not ruin that with the like blue color or red color. But that's just my personal opinion and it also depends on, uh, of course, which board you use it with and if you have a specific color theme in your PC or whatever. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this video and um, if you like it, give it a thumbs up. If you want to see more kind of tests like this on my channel, please let me know. Otherwise, um, I wish you a very nice day and see you soon.